one of the, I, I didn't give proper thanks, but uh, both Rob Chaskin and Deborah Gorman-Smith, who are faculty at SSA with me, uh, ha have been helpful in helping plan this conference and working with, with Emily and, and the Urban Network to do so. And they've uh, put together a nice panel, which we've called the Sociological View of the Neighbor, which I think is probably not, uh, it, you know, given limited space in the program, it'd probably have a, a longer title. Um, but each, uh, but but this panel is going to focus kind of on the social dimensions um, and some of the inequality uh, issues of inequality that we've uh, discussed uh, already this morning. I think it'll be a nice complement. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to do a, 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 you know brief introductions, and then and then uh, and then uh, Rob will come up and and, and make his presentation. Um, uh, this panel's got uh, three presentations. The first by Rob Chaskin uh, focuses on um, on uh, concentrated poverty and public housing reform. Uh, and Rob is the Associate Professor and Deputy Dean for Strategic Initiatives at the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration. So please uh, join me in welcoming Rob uh, to the podium. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you. Am I like echoing? I feel like I'm, so I need to put this, can you hear me if it's like here? Okay. No. Okay, here? Yes. All right. Uh, so as, um, as Scott suggested, we're going to do um, what I guess Monty Python used to call uh, something completely different. It's not really diff completely different, but it's a, it is a bit of a departure focusing now more specifically on this panel on the social dimensions of neighborhood and of uh, thinking about neighborhood, uh, the ways in which neighborhoods have an impact on uh, life course trajectories and the well-being of people who live there and particular kinds of outcomes, and also the ways in which policy intervention might uh, shape or try to reshape or redirect those outcomes for people who live in neighborhoods. So my own, um, my own uh, uh, talk here is focused on, really looks at the neighborhood itself as social intervention, and it takes as its example public housing reform uh, uh, in Chicago, although it's a much broader um, uh, set of policy initiatives, both nationally and internationally, uh, efforts to, to deconcentrate poverty uh, and remake public housing by integrating uh, low-income people from public housing complexes into presumably better, right, well-functioning um, neighborhoods. So I think that, you know, those of you who were at last note's keynote uh, talk, uh, Press Jackson ended with a few questions, and I think the first two of his questions are um, are particularly relevant here. One, the first one was, what happens to a neighborhood when it ceases to exist, right? And the second one that he raised was, how can or can you build a neighborhood from scratch? And in some way, these redevelopments that I'm going to be talking about try to answer both of those questions. So I'm going to try to do three things. I'm going to focus particularly on neighborhood context and youth and the relationship between trying to remake neighborhoods um, to have a positive effect on disadvantaged youth. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about poverty deconcentration policy and public housing reform as a response to this. And then I'm going to talk from research. This is based on uh, about six years of field research that uh, colleagues and I have been doing here in Chicago on the plan for transformation, and more particularly from a recent paper uh, that uh, was recently published that I wrote with uh, Florian Sickling and Mark Joseph, focusing on youth in these, in these mixed income communities replacing public housing complexes. So I think there's little debate that um, neighborhoods matter, right? They matter for youth for a bunch of different ways. They are the sites of socialization. Y young people engage uh, both within their families and family circumstances are in part shaped by the neighborhoods in which they live. Uh, but their peer groups are often grounded in neighborhoods. Their schools are in neighborhoods. Uh, and so in this way, neighborhoods represent contexts of either opportunity or constraint or some combination of those of those uh, things, right? So the built environment in neighborhoods, um, the nature and quality of organizations, the quality of the housing, the availability or lack of availability of parks and recreational space uh, and organizations either promote or constrain healthy development for, for kids growing up in them. And, the, and these neighborhoods provide either positive or negative or some combination of positive and negative influences on their uh, developmental trajectories. Um, and the effect on neighborhoods, uh, the effect on youth of neighborhoods is becomes more direct as kids get older. So small children often, their relationship to the, to the neighborhood is more directly mediated by their family or by their school. But as kids become teenagers and become older and more independent, they are more uh, independently in, engaged and more, they both are affected by and affect, right, the nature of neighborhoods and neighborhood dynamics in which they live. 
So all this is borne out, I think, uh, by about a quarter century of, uh, of neighborhood effects research. Um, there's some debate as to the relative effect on neighborhoods and uh, on youth versus uh, other factors, of, for example, the family level. Um, there's some debate about the actual lines of causality, about how neighborhoods, in fact, you know, affect uh, uh, youth and youth development. But there's clearly very strong associations between um, both the compositional aspects of neighborhoods um, and the social aspects of neighborhoods and their impacts on youth development, right? So concentrated disadvantage, residential instability, uh, racial or ethnic se segregation um, on the sort of compositional side, and then the nature of social relations, of social norms and networks, uh, the nature of institutional relationships and the ways in which uh, families and young people engage in them all have some uh, impact. And a lot of this research focuses in particular on the deleterious effects of living in concentrated disadvantaged neighborhoods, concentrated poverty, right? So a whole range of negative outcomes around child abuse and dropout and uh, crime and delinquency and joblessness, right, are associated with high concentrated poverty neighborhoods. Which brings me to public housing, which is both uh, emblematic and has been contributing to concentrated urban poverty uh, in the U.S. And the Chicago public housing uh, uh, system is maybe the most infamous uh, in terms of its failings on this regard. So the arguments here that you know that so that youth, young people living, growing up in public housing, uh, are you know have uh, have to contend with. A uh, number of uh, interrelated and cumulative effects uh, from of these concentrated poverty neighborhoods. Right? These are dangerous, unhealthy environments. They have few uh, lines of access to important institutions and to resources. There's there are arguments about the the the, the, the narrowness about their networks. Um, and their inability to tap into information flows and opportunities that come through relationships with uh, people who have totally different networks than their own. Um, there, there's low levels of social control and so high levels of violence um, in these neighborhoods. And, uh, and an argument is, uh, and we'll get back to this later, that all of this leads to you know, what, what uh, Bill Wilson talked about as kind of, um, isol uh, the is of social isolation, right? That they're isolated, disconnected from um, mainstream institutions, mainstream uh, aspirations, and role models that can help them both think differently about future aspiration and actually achieve those, um, those goals. So in response to this, there's a very large uh, national, and as I said earlier, uh, internationally as well, effort to deconcentrate uh, uh, poverty um, centered uh, to a large extent on public housing reform. And there's two broad policy directions in the United States. One has to do with dispersal. Uh, largely through leveraging market mechanisms like vouchers and providing opportunities for public housing residents to get subsidized housing in the private market. And second, through development, and particularly development of mixed income communities. So intentionally uh, diverse, uh, economically diverse at least, um, uh, neighborhoods that are replacing large scale public housing uh, uh, communities in, uh, in the city. Um, so, you know, and I think I, I've touched on most of these things, so I won't dwell, but there are all of the, the arguments for this uh, reformulation of public housing, and particularly for the mixed income com component, its most sort of, uh, its clearest instantiation, has to do with the benefits of integration, right? If public housing families and youth were isolated in high concentrated poverty in public housing, integrating them into well-functioning mixed income diverse communities will um, allow them uh, directions, you know, will allow them access to the fruits of the city, the opportunities it provides, and a ladder to social and economic mobility. Um, so this has to do with both ideas about how they will gain access to resources, right, both social resources, relational resources, and social capital, um, and the benefits of, of uh, political and market um, influence of their higher income neighbors who will bring more responsive services to the communities in which they're now living. And also a set of uh, more cultural assumptions, right? Influence on aspiration and behavior through providing access to middle class and working class role models in these communities and through more effective social control, uh, which uh, higher income and more stable homeowning uh, neighbors will help to provide through their vigilance and their investment and their ways in which they can command more responsiveness on the part of police and other uh, institutions. 
Um, and at least for the mixed income component of public housing reform, uh, they draw quite explicitly on new urbanist principles about which we've heard a bit, uh, a, a fair amount earlier, and we may come back to. Uh, I would argue they draw quite selectively on these principles, but there's a, there was a very uh, tight connection or effort uh, for, with HUD and the um, uh, Council Commission uh, Congress on New Urbanism to, to, to craft and sort of codify a set of principles that were meant to guide the redevelopments. So very briefly, in Chicago's the biggest example of trying to totally reshape public housing along these fronts. Now, our, uh, it's a massive effort, 15 years and counting, uh, $3 billion uh, public and private money and counting. Uh, tens of thousands of uh, units demolished, many more tens of thousands of residents relocated, and more tens of thousands that aren't counted because they lived in public housing units but were not leaseholders, and so those are not being, those are relocated or they are removed and need to relocate, but they're not part of the relocation process. And part of this is 10, includes at least 10, uh, actually Lathrop Homes, which uh, was uh, mentioned earlier, uh, is is above that number 10. They keep, the Chicago Housing Authority is increasing the number of mixed income communities they're trying to develop. So on the dispersion side, how is this happening? So one, one part of this, and this is the largest component of the plan for transformation in terms of numbers of residents uh, moving. Uh, that's five minutes left? That can't be right. Just kidding. Okay, I need to, I need to talk faster. Uh, how is the relocation moving? This is, um, uh, th this is um, on the this side. I think I think the thing. Uh, this is uh, f family developments are these light ones, largely concentrated in the south and west side, and the scattered site housing, which began to be uh, proliferated in the 70s, um, is somewhat dispersed. But it's from these white dots that the um, uh, distribution of public housing residents has moved. And so you can see significant dispersion to other neighborhoods. Are they better neighborhoods? Well, they tend to be, as you can see here, the dark areas are percent a high percentage, 91 to 100% African American. Those neighborhoods still t tend to correlate uh, largely with low, low income neighborhoods. So these are mo they're moving largely to still racially segregated neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods, uh, though not necessarily quite as poor as um, uh, as the public housing com communities from which they left. Now the mixed income communities though are more intentional efforts to promote integration, right? They in have clearly improved the built environment and there've been significant uh, improvement in, sa in safety in these neighborhoods and some clear uh, 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 economic and to some extent in some sites racial mix. But how is this working out in terms of the goals and the assumptions about how neighborhoods would impact the benefit, would benefit uh, youth and their, uh, their trajectories? So we asked a set of questions, right? One about what people are assuming, developers and people living in these neighborhoods, about how these neighborhoods would have an impact on youth. Second, about how youth actually engage in these neighborhoods and what the neighborhoods provide as, as, as positive environments. And third, what are the, the influences, the reciprocal influences? How are these neighborhoods impacting low-income youth moving back into them, and how are the youth themselves having an impact? Very briefly, we focused on three of the mixed income sites out of the major 10, six in years of uh, in-depth field research. So with regard to assumptions and expectations, um, m both developers, CHA personnel, uh, development professionals, and residents, uh, particularly higher income residents, assume that these mixed income communities are gonna be beneficial for poor youth because they're gonna provide safe and healthy environments for them. They're gonna influence youth attitudes and behavior. So these ideas about um, uh, role models and the ways in which living in mixed income and uh, well-functioning neighborhoods are going to have an impact on young people's future aspirations are clearly shared by those who are trying to uh, recreate these neighborhoods. So as a housing authority official said, the children of these public housing residents have got to be exposed on a day-to-day -day basis to something different than that which they saw in the developments. Right? They have to be exposed to people who go to school and go through college and see that as the norm, not as the exception, right? because it's hard to build your life around an exception. And there are also a set of assumptions about, uh, bridge, about, about uh, the bridging, potential bridging role of young people in these communities, that kids would get together with other kids, and by virtue of those kid-to-kid -kid relationships, families would begin to know one another, share information, um, and uh, the larger family unit would benefit. Um, 
uh, and this would facilitate right access to the whole family and, and to the building of social capital among low-income residents. But there are a set of challenges here. One are dem demographic realities. Public housing residents tend to have larger families and older kids than the higher income uh, owners and, and renters that are living in these communities. There are structural circumstances. These kids do not go to the same schools. Uh, even if they were the same age, the white middle class has largely abandoned the public school system in, in Chicago. And there are differences in the experience and response to these new neighborhoods among higher and lower income neighborhoods, neighbors. And we'll talk about both of those things in a moment. So uh, clearly these are better environments. They're, the built environment is better, they're safer. Um, but there's been limited interaction uh, among youth from different backgrounds, between adults and youth of different backgrounds, and within institutional, community, or organizational uh, settings. Limited opportunities for youth. So in, in focusing on the spatial redevelopment of these neighborhoods, uh, they have these, the developments have tended to lag behind in the kind of social spaces and opportunities for young people that might promote the kind of uh, benefits that um, uh, theory would suggest. And more importantly, um, may, maybe these, these sites are seen, these neighborhoods are seen to provide greater, inf greater freedom for some, but also greater constraint for others because of family management patterns. So higher income homeowners moving to these neighborhoods are more constrained, you know, are, are, engaged, are keeping their kids inside, basically, and keeping them apart from their neighbors out of fear. Uh, that, that, that things are, that the neighborhood is, is more dangerous than where they came. Public housing residents find these neighborhoods to be much safer, and so feel free to let their kids out to socialize um, unsupervised. So very quickly, a public housing resident says, I think, thank the good Lord, I can finally release him to have some type of socialization, because he could not play at all outside at Ida B. Wells. Uh, there was too much shooting and everything. But a market rate renter says, I don't let him, my, my son, socialize, because I'm not putting, down or, putting anyone down or anything. But you know what I'm saying? From what I see, I come home or look out the window, and like they're running wild. These other kids are running wild, right? So there's this um, significant difference in how families are managing and controlling the ways in which their young people are engaging in the neighborhood. So this combination of kind of limited opportunities, lack of recreational space, and these dynamics of avoidance have led to some serious contention around public space uh, and sort of the creation of regulatory regimes that govern the use of that public space. Uh, and youth are a kind of contentious core of these, of these problems, right? So on the one hand, you have the sort of reappropriation of privatized space. And here's part of where I say new urbanist principles are used selectively. You know, there's relatively little sort of civic space in these communities. They do dwell on the notion of de defensible space and uh, uh, private and easily observable entrances that residents will take, uh, take, um, uh, take responsibility for. Um, and so, but what in, then what in the absence of civic space, you've got the sort of reappropriation of this space, right? Kids and others hanging out on street corners, pulling up chairs in front of buildings, sitting on stoops, uh, congregating and socializing in median areas like this, which uh, public housing residents who have lived there before feel is a park and homeowners feel is a median and should be empty green space. And so there are conflicts about, right, what, pu what is public, what should be public, and how publicness gets managed and, um, uh, and monitored. So a member of one of the development teams says, when you see a group of young African-American boys in here, you know, it's, it's not just poverty, but race plays a complicated uh, and fundamental role here. Just hanging on the corner, it doesn't necessarily mean they're up to no good, they're just talking. But if you don't understand that, and all you've seen was that you've been on, what you've seen on, intelligence, on television, then you make the implication, you know, that, oh, they must be up to no good, right? Uh, or a market rainer says, sometimes we've had to find young teenagers sitting on the steps, loitering on the steps, a lot of noise outside, right? Standing outside in clusters, skipping, playing. I just feel like play out back, right? Instead of play out here. I feel that's a bit scary, especially when it's young teenage boys. So a conflict about the very notion of what neighborhood life is like, uh, or should be like, what urban life is like, is, is playing out here. So very briefly, sort of counter to the theoretical expectations that by 
remaking the neighborhood, right? By just by using the neighborhood itself, uh, uh, at least the, the built environment and of the neighborhood, um, uh, would lead and 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 integrating right diverse populations into the neighborhood uh, would lead to role modeling and informal social control. What we see instead is a kind of non-interventionist stance on the part of higher income residents and, and homeowners. They don't want to get involved. And second, an increasing reliance on formal mechanisms of social control. So they call property management, they call the police, rather than engaging directly with their neighbors. Higher income neighbors in these contexts feel that low income neighbors don't um, control their kids. Um, and low income neighbors feel that they are being unfairly criticized and targeted. And then just briefly, I think there are a few implications as I'm out of time. One is um, I think we need to think much more uh, deeply about how to, how to engage youth um, across different backgrounds and what neighborhoods can provide and what neighborhoods need in order to shape those kinds of um, engagements. Clearly, n much more investment in youth spaces and uh, programs and opportunities, uh, both for recreation and for work and uh, out of school time. I think, though, the fundamentally, there's some shifting institutionalized perceptions about youth, particularly youth of color and poor youth, that we need to sort of grapple with. And it's a, a hard thing to do. We, the, but there's the clearly underlying a lot of this is, is uh, a sense that young people are, are seen largely as problems, as sources of threat, rather than as uh, emerging adults that are experimenting with um, autonomy. Um, and the response then is a set of very punitive responses, zero tolerance policies, right? Uh, uh, rules against uh, gathering in public and so forth. And then finally, there's clearly broader systemic challenges that as crucial as neighborhoods are, and as important as they are as sites of socialization and uh, the, the activity space of daily life, they are nested in bigger systems. Um, and in uh, bigger institutions that have huge implications for young people and those connections between what neighborhoods provide and these larger systems need to be uh, addressed um, directly and concretely. So thank you.